be talking about sensing, but I'm going to try and talk about it in a rather different approach, um, how accuracy isn't necessarily the only kind of goal for this stuff. I'm going to try and talk in terms of a methodology, a kind of conceptual methodology, but I'm also going to talk about a participatory methodology. So I'm talking about prototyping in terms of scaling, and I have this kind of odd idea of scaling that I'll talk about. So yeah, I'm going to talk about this problem of scale in the Internet of Things. And I'm going to talk about something called actor network theory, which is a peculiar kind of philosophy, because I think it allows us to think about scale in a rather different way. Um, and then I'm going to try and talk about how you actually design with this kind of scaling in mind, give you a practical example of uh, noise sensing, around Heathrow and how working with people allows you to design in a different way by thinking about scale and what possible implications this might have. So this problem of scale that I was talking about, um, what I see in the Internet of Things and actually in smart cities as well is that you have very, very different models going on. You have two very different ideas. You have a kind of what I'm calling a macro idea. Um, macro visions of the Internet of Things, and you have micro visions. So what I'm calling a macro vision is something that is talking about the smart citizen, for example. It's this idea of the kind of collective. It's very much an urbanism idea. It's talking about you know, city scale stuff, and it's talking about normative ideas. They want to make the city better. And then in contrast, what I'm calling a micro vision is very much the gizmo, the idea, the small technology the kind of single app, you know, the classic scenario is somebody goes into a new city, doesn't know how to find the nearest restaurant, so they kind of get their smartphone out, find out where the nearest restaurant is. It's very much for the individual. There's no sense in which that they're connected with a social network that they might ask somebody. It's the insular individual. There's no sense in which the idea is supposed to change the world. It might make that person's evening better by being able to find the restaurant, but it's very much an insular kind of small-scale idea. Nothing wrong with that. The point I'm trying to make is that they're very, very different visions. So my point is that I think we really see these as very dramatically different concepts that keep reappearing into the Internet of Things and in smart cities. And I think it's a problem, because the problem is we don't know how to move between them. So the bit that I'm going to suggest is what I'm calling micro-macro prototyping, a different way of moving between them kind of making that transition happening. So the, the transition isn't necessarily towards the, the kind of the macro, but simply to be able to have some flexibility. It's like an oscillating movement. And if you want to find out a bit more about it, there's actually a paper, if you just search for that title, Micro Macro Prototyping, there's a paper that I've just written that's just gone uh, in open access, so if you want to find out a bit more about it. And the way to do this kind of oscillating movement is by thinking differently about scale, okay? So I use this thing called actor network theory. It's a philosophical idea that I think is very practical um, for designers and for people who think about networks, which I think is the core idea that we work with here. And the key thing about it is that there's no difference between humans and technologies and other entities. We're all about forming networks together. And the point is, the idea is also that we are networks ourselves. So a human being, rather than being the kind of the starting point, is that the idea that we are networks in ourselves. You know, I have a huge amount of bacteria inside myself. I'm, I'm constructed of lots of things. The same way that lots of things out there are constructed of things. So let me give an example, something like the NHS, right? We're all quite happy to talk about the NHS as a thing in itself, and yet it's actually made up of lots of people, lots of doctors, lots of nurses, and lots of machinery. And we can quite happily talk about it as an entity in itself. And we only think about it as individuals when something goes wrong. For example, when it turns out some doctor is kind of end up killing somebody and suddenly that doctor is to blame. We have a real problem of moving from that individual within the organization and the big idea of the NHS, let's say, or the small technology fails. So we're having a problem doing that kind of scaling. So using actor network theory is a suggestion to think about these things as not being such disparate things, but actually having a continuity of scale and how these things are slowly built up out of each other. So the point is to not use a completely different model of thinking about, you know, we might think uh, doctors might have their own particular training, which is very different from the people who are kind of building the machines. Using the same kind of approach 
across the scale might allow us to kind of think about the continuity between these ideas. So in terms of design, Actor Network really, theory talks about the idea of enrolling people into networks. This is how you make things get bigger. So in order to convince people you have a great idea, you need to get people to believe it. Suddenly the idea gets bigger and something like Facebook suddenly appears to be very big. Do you remember Orkut, right? I remember Orkut, now nobody remembers it at all. Why is Facebook much bigger than Orkut? Simply because we, claim, we believe the fact that it suddenly got bigger by having lots of people enrolled in it. It's simply the same idea that you need to, things appear to get bigger by, through enrollment. And the bit that's interesting is creating these unlikely connections that allow these things to scale in this way. So I'm gonna talk about this unlikely idea with the context of Heathrow in a very particular hard utilitarian sensing context. You know, I'm working with people who live under the flight path and who have problems with aircraft noise. So how can you use that idea to rethink something like Heathrow? So I'm suggesting it's actually an opportunity for the Internet of Things because around monitoring, many of the kind of models around monitoring actually come from the 1960s and haven't really changed since then. You basically have these things called um, noise annoyance curves that are supposed to kind of relate basically community annoyance to decibel levels. And these things really haven't changed since the 60s and 70s. And there's no sense in which you can have cheap, new, personalized um, monitoring equipment in this that actually takes people's personal experiences into account. So I think there's a really interesting opportunity to reframe the relationship here. So the work I've been doing is actually working in a participatory way with local people in workshops to do prototypes. These are very, very small, cheap prototypes to understand ideas of what might be going on. Um, just to give an example here, the device on the right, what it does when it um, senses a high noise level, let's say above 90 dBA, it suddenly sends a text message to somebody's mobile phone. So you can put an individual person's mobile phone number into this device and it makes a direct connection. So it cuts out the kind of institutional middleman. Okay? So this is a prototype that was an idea. So when I presented this to the group, as soon as I presented, they suddenly started laughing because they realized they could put some politician's phone number in this. So every time, <laughs> every 90 seconds when a plane flew over, suddenly this politician would be receiving an SMS message. Okay? So the idea is this is not a practical device that's designed to just annoy the politician, but it was designed to get the local people to think about this stuff because they're obviously concerned about this, but they're very much caught into this kind of decibel noise argument. I, you take your kind of reasonable rational data and you take it to the politician who may or may not agree with it, probably dismiss it because you're not following all the rules. But we started talking about a different model in which you might build devices that might disrupt that relationship in a different way. So this is a workshop, and the bit that was really interesting is there was a real focus on developing alternative metrics. And this is not something that, you know, was just the kind of crazy activists wanting to do this. This is something that acousticians are working on. Um, they're trying to develop different metrics as well, because there's an acknowledgement that the metrics that are used haven't changed the 60s and 70s. So here's a space where, by working with people, developing technology with them, we can develop different metrics and develop different kind of devices through them. So one of the things that they're concerned about, for example, is the frequency of planes. There's planes every 90 seconds, which are not being taken into account by this kind of average de decibel level that's being used in the moment. So the, the, kind of, the institutional standard doesn't represent the experience very well. Okay? So that's hence the need for new metrics. So the point I'm trying to get at, um, what I'm working on as a result of that kind of particular workshop, I'm now developing some Raspberry Pi devices that are both accurate and calibrated. They're doing the DBA. I, they address the institutional need for having that kind of data. And this is actually something that local people want themselves. But they also do something else. So these things are live streaming audio streams. And the idea is that these are going to be going in people's lofts. So you'll be able to create a realistic, highly calibrated data feed of the noise in somebody's house. But you'll also be able to listen to the sound. And what's important about this is that the people who are affected by this, they also don't really listen to the sound anymore. It's become a noise and it's become very difficult to talk about as something that has qualities, okay? It ceased to be, 
it ceased to be something of, of interest, if you like. So the idea of addressing this stuff in different ways suddenly starts opening new boundaries up. So for example, I'm now working with some ornithologists and sound artists who are using, for example, the sound feed. What they want to do is they want to identify the effect on birds, for example. Nobody talks about birds in the Heathrow context. It's all about people and the planes in the sky. So being able to have a device that can automatically machine learn and identify the birds and see how they're being affected by the plane noise suddenly starts bringing in new people into this. So this is what I'm talking about by scaling. Suddenly I'm not talking about just a device anymore. I'm trying to build a network. I'm trying to build a network of people who are all engaged by this particular device and this particular issue. So I'm talking about ornithologists, sound artists, technology developers, the local council with whom I've done a project so far now, who've actually used some of this data that we've been developing um, as part of the kind of consultation around the third runway. So despite the fact that we've used a device so far that is not super accurate, we've already had political input into the process. And we're starting to build a bigger network. And this is where the scaling really becomes useful. You can start building these unlikely connections. You can start bringing people together at the level of design. So when we have these, these discussions about, you know, who, how do we make change? That was one of the questions earlier on. I think it's very much at the design of technology level where we can design particular potentials, particular scaling potentials into the devices themselves. Depending on how we design the devices, we allow them to build certain networks around themselves. If the device I built only produced decibel numbers that get uploaded to an on online repository, I would never be able to get the ornithologists and the sound artists involved. By making particular design choices at the hardware level, and by being the same person who's doing the overall project, as well as doing the design, I can start building a network around these devices. So this is the, this is the key point of scaling. And I think this is how you can start creating, you can, you can get away from this micro-macro approach I was trying to tell you about. Anyway, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Christian. Um, as someone who until recently lived in the Heathrow flight path over in Richmond, um, I... <clears throat> And in fact, one of the houses I lived there was literally, I, I could lie in bed, look out the window, and I could see the aeroplanes for half of the day literally going over my face. It was incredible. But you do get that habituation. You do get used to that sound. It's only when we moved away to Kingston about six months ago, um, and then on the odd day trip went back to where we used to live, did the sound really become totally loud. And we, we didn't realise how much that was part of our lives. Um, sound artists. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about what your vision for, 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 that, part, for, for, for that part is, because that, that's really interesting. So the thing that's interesting is HACAN, the people we're working with, who are the, the noise pressure organisation, they're very excited to actually demonstrate the impact of Heathrow on a wider part of London, i.e. being able to listen to the same plane from multiple places at the same point. So imagine a sound artist that can do a live mix where you can actually listen to the same plane from multiple locations simultaneously, right? You suddenly kind of give people a real sense of the impact of this noise on people in different places. You can literally listen to it in different places. And you can mix that with other data, like flight trackers, so you can see exactly what the name of the plane is and who it's got on it and where it's come from that's making that noise as well. Mm -hmm. Opportunity for mashup there is quite interesting. Um, any questions for Christian, please, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, we've got a question at the back over there. Come on, run, George, run. Any more questions? Preferably at the other side of the room to make sure we can keep George fit. <laughs> Unfortunately not. Hello, sir. Um, thanks. That was really, really interesting. I've, I've been involved a little bit with planetary skin, but the piece of work done by Cisco with NASA looking at environmental monitoring in a crowdsourced way um, using microsatellites and things like that. And it's starting really to come online now. So I think, I mean, what you showed there, I think, I think the text should go to the MLP, right? So I think, I think that's where it's going in terms of environmental monitoring by the citizenry. And I just think, how, how far do you want to go with it in terms of an application that comes into the marketplace? What are you thinking in terms of you know, creating that platform? Have you looked at that? Because I, I really like the model of the local node scaling up, and I think it fits what's going to be needed for the IoT uh, protocol infrastructure as well. I mean, the way I personally approach it is I'm building on Raspberry Pi because it's a ubiquitous device and I'm using a commonly available microphone. The whole thing is going to be open source. 
the idea is that people can buy it themselves and build it very cheaply. So I, I don't need to make money out of it because I'm an academic now. So I, I kind of see a massive growth in people building this stuff themselves. And I just don't think we need actually the kind of, I don't think we need a commercial model around this stuff personally. I mean, I've just been on part of a three year um, academic uh, research project that wants to kind of commercialize the sensors afterwards. And despite, you know, these very, very expensive air quality sensors, they didn't end up with something that was a commercial, commercializable device. And I think it's, it's not necessarily the best model to move towards personally. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, question right at the back there. Nikita's there with the microphone. I remember at the Citizen Science Conference a couple of years ago, there were people doing something similar, but with smartphone apps, which was fits a crowdsource model. Uh, why have you gone with dedicated hardware rather than with a smartphone app? Uh, the smartphone app was terrible. Um, it was a random number generator, like many kind of devices are these days. This is something I can build myself, and I can I know what it does and how good it is. I mean, once you actually take these things into calibration chambers, um, you start seeing what's really going on. Um, you can add other features to it that don't exist if you use ready-made apps. So I, I kind of see myself as a designer trying to develop new, different models into the device. So you need to start from scratch with these things, I find. I, I remember Qualcomm were doing so a smartphone app based thing that was going to triangulate and deliver precise locations of gunshots. Right. Um, wow. So I must, I must say, I never heard about it again, but uh, is this because all smartphone microphones just don't really work for this kind of application? The, or is it something about the way those, those particular apps were built? The best app is something that's built by, called Noise Tube, if you want to look it up. That's noise, noise Tube. Sorry, uh, yeah, Noise Tube. Noise Tube. T U B E yeah, that was the is one the, that I downloaded two years ago. That's the best one because they actually calibrate on mm -hmm. a, a kind of different models of phone. Um, so that's a lot of work involved. So I think that the big problem is that a lot of people just think they can build an app and then just kind of throw it out there. It's actually a lot of work involved in kind of having to calibrate every single new model that comes on with mm -hmm. Android, for example, and the Android you know, new firmware comes on and Even suddenly between if, one model and another model from the same manufacturer. The it's extremely the difficult. Thing. Yeah. In, interesting what Apple announced earlier this week about research kit. You know, it knows how many people there are using iPhones and, and so forth, but the, with the metrics that they can get from that, yes, there's going to be some crap figures around, but I, what they're hedging their bets on is that purely from the number of metrics that they can get, and the fact that they do have some scientific input from a lot of universities and stuff, they will be able to get some value for that. But I guess if it's monitoring bodily things, that's one thing, because your smartphone's normally in your pocket or not, not too far away from you. As soon as you start looking at aeroplanes flying over your roof or gunshots or something, you don't have so much control of that in a way. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot, there's a lot of things that people should, should take people's attention, mm. that people should be using their phone for. And I think there's some things that should be left towards being ambient in the background. I and mean, I just don't think people should be having to take part in monitoring noise by hand because I think yep. there's a lot of work involved in it. I mean, I think this is the kind of thing that you can put in your loft that actually is best done that way. I think there's other things, you know, if we want to take a photograph, we want to be the person taking the photograph. You know, there's certain things that should be manual and there's certain other things that should be active, I think. Terrific. Um, that's all time we've Thanks got for now, but thank you very much, Christian Nold.